Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Clarifying Catholicism. Ordinarily, we explore theological topics, but in this series, we investigate the writings of, in my opinion, the most important little-known philosopher of the 20th century, Javier Zubiri. This is not a theological series at all whatsoever. However, if you want to do good theology, you'll need a good philosophical backbone first. So if you want to check out the rest of the episodes in this series, check the link in the description. Without further ado, on to the show. At this point in the series, we've drawn distinctions between reality, truth, and being, which Zubiri claims has never been adequately done before in Western philosophy. According to the classical and scholastic worldview, reality, truth, and being are pretty much the same things, and they are located outside the physical realm. The body delivers jumbled content for the soul to abstract its reality, truth, and being. This is problematic because it implies a static universe whose reality is solely shaped by the soul, rather than the body. It not only assumes that truth is something to be accessed, but it struggles to respond to problems of how different cultures could arrive at different truths, and why we, once achieving truth, seek further inquiry if that truth should satisfy our curiosities. Modernity may have taken the soul out of philosophy, but it merely replaced it with the mind. While classical philosophy believed that the soul accessed reality, truth, and being, modern philosophy believed that the mind constructed reality, truth, and being. Thus, like classical philosophy, reality, truth, and being were things to be achieved, and the lowly body remained entirely subject to the almighty mind. For Zubiri, reality, truth, and being are not extrinsic to our physical world, nor are they constructed by our minds. Rather, they are baked into the physical world that we participate in, not reach for, every day. Additionally, reality, truth, and being are distinct, though they are united by the real content that shapes them. Reality is the formalization of real content, truth is what the intellect produces in this formalization, and being is the actualization of things in reality as they are related to other things. All three of these are very material processes and things that we participate in, just as we participate in smelling, tasting, touching, etc. Today we're going to cover reason. Remember that while primordial apprehensions concern individual apprehensions of the real, ulterior apprehensions concern uniting these individual apprehensions. There are two kinds of ulterior apprehension. The first is logos. This is when primordial apprehensions are placed among each other and in reference to each other. This placement of things in reference to each other causes the intellect to produce two kinds of dual truth. Truth as authenticity and truth as conformity. Reason, which is the second type of ulterior apprehension, produces its own unique kind of truth. But before we go into that, let's review the two that belong to Logos. First, there is truth as authenticity. This occurs when we move from raw stimulation to forming concepts about them. Because truth as authenticity involves placing the concept into reality, this concerns logos. Second is truth as conformity, which concerns judgment. Once the raw stimulus is etched into reality, we begin making judgments about the concept. Now here's the thing. Our knowledge isn't limited to a set number of apprehensions between things. It's not like our knowledge is contained to the connections we've drawn from things we've apprehended. Recall that judgments raise more questions than answers. If I make the judgment wine is delicious, I might ask, well, what causes wine to be delicious? And the neat thing about this third type of truth, truth of reason, is that it doesn't need any additional apprehensions to work. First, something doesn't need to prompt me to ask, why is the wine so delicious? I just do it on my own. Then. To answer that question, I don't need to directly apprehend an answer to it. Rather, I can expand my field of reference to include many potential answers. Think of it like this. In the primordial apprehension, I deal only with thing A, wine. In the logos, I deal with things A and B, wine and delicious. Wine is delicious. Because of reason, though, I not only desire to explain the relationship between things A and B, wine and deliciousness, but I then bring in 
different things as possibilities, things C, D, E, and F as hypotheses to satisfy this why, this explanation. Maybe it's because the good grapes caused the wine to be good. Maybe it was good soil. Maybe it was from a river that Jesus crossed a long time ago. The point is that reason not only searches for explanations of the connections established via Logos, but it brings in a seemingly infinite number of possibilities to satisfy that search. Thus, we arrive at our definition of reason. Reason is the ulterior apprehension of taking all the interconnections we've made via Logos, searching for more connections, and exploring different possibilities to explain them. For example, if I apprehend tree and apprehend green, Logos might connect the two things, tree is green, to each other. But it won't go much further than making those connections. We have this desire, which comes from reason, to explain what makes tree green. Reason then attempts to satiate this desire. Maybe someone painted it green. Maybe chemtrails from the government made it green. Maybe there's something in its chemical composition that makes it green. Now reason bases itself on the apprehensions we've gained from Logos. Thus it is intimately connected with reality and does not go above reality. That's crucial, because some philosophers like Immanuel Kant would make reason and reality totally distinct. If anything, reality gives reason the ingredients to come up with explanations for how things work. Thus, reason is dependent on Logos, and Logos is dependent on primordial apprehension, which of course is dependent on real content. Now reason has three moments. First is inquiry or searching. This means that reason has an inquisitive character. The second is in-depth intellection, which means its search is for a more thorough understanding of reality. The third is called intellective measuring. This means that reason not only sets up its own searches or problems, it also dictates the conditions by which I'll figure that out, which is counting the jelly beans. The most deep-seated of these measures by which we reason are called principles. Reason is not logical rigor as many of the Greeks, scholastics, and Leibniz held. That would mean that we could connect all our apprehensions just by thinking about them, which isn't how knowledge works. We have to experience to primordially apprehend things in order to connect them. Reason is not the supreme judge of reality, since reality shapes reason, not the other way around. Finally, reason is not an unfolding of concepts over time that shapes reality as someone like Hegel would say. Again, this would make reality dependent on reason, whereas reason is dependent on reality. All three of these philosophical systems are mistaken in their identification of reason with judgment. Reason is not judgment, reason is our in-depth organization of reality that involves judgments, but is not identical with judgments. Remember, judgment is just the affirmation of things connected in reality. It is not the connection between things themselves. Thus, while reason involves judgment, it goes beyond merely affirming things by generating more and more questions and pursuing answers. The endless thirst for knowledge was explored in our episode on judgment, in which we talked about how one judgment yields more questions, but that's not judgment's doing. Reason is the source of this endless search. Now, when reason is tasked with measuring real content, we say there is a problem. That problem has several possible solutions. It is the existence of possibility, the existence of infinite explanations of how the world works, that is the essence of reason. For it is possibility that causes us to question what could explain the universe to behave the way it does and come up with endless hypotheses to explain it. This is significant because in classical philosophy, the essence of reason is the soul reaching for knowledge of universal truth. This implies that once we reach a true answer, we can cease our search for knowledge. The opposite is true though. Reason does not search for anything static. It is a physical ulterior apprehension that operates in a physical concrete world. The physicality of reason makes it, like Logos, dynamic, and its dynamism causes it to be open to searching for endless possibilities of answers. On the other hand, when modern philosophers, particularly existentialists, set possibility as the cornerstone of knowledge, they did so assuming that we can self-determine the answers to our own questions. This means if I wonder what the essence of tree or stake or animal or human or fetus or gender is, I have the power to determine it myself. 
This is not what Zubiri says. The existence of possibility comes from real content, and the answers to questions that we settle on depend on evidence given by the real. So, although possibility might be what drives reason's search and provide it with options, only real content can satisfy that search. Next episode, we will wrap everything up we know. Next episode, we will wrap up everything we've learned to answer the epistemological question that Zubiri set out to answer in his book. How do we know things? Until then, have a great day. God bless you.